Okay, so now we're recording. Welcome, everybody. Um, as I was just mentioning, we're going to um, mix up the, uh, the order of events uh, this evening a little bit, and I want to show you a couple of video clips that are relevant to production design. And Brittany's in the room. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Howdy. We're going to um, have a look at some staff, and I'm going to. Sh I'm going to. Um, I'll need someone just to um, let me know that it's actually working correctly. I just want to play that little clip um, from the uh, production artist, the visual development artist that I talked about in the first week, just in case you guys didn't get to check out the link. It only goes for a few minutes, and then we'll have a little chat about it. What I really love about this clip is that she's talking about how she got into the industry and how she became a um, you know, visual development artist. And as, as she's talking, there's a little animation at play. So th she's obviously made this animation, especially for the interview, which I think is, is quite cute. And so it's a really lovely style as well. Sort of like a, a children's book kind of style. Um, anyway, we'll have a look at that. And I'm, I've shared the computer sound, so hopefully the audio will come through. If it doesn't, um, please, Give me a hoy. Um, so I'm just going to play this one here, the Aurora Jimenez one again. Um, hang on. Now, can you see my PowerPoint slide? Yes. It says resources. Yes. Okay. Now I'm just going to play, see if the video comes through. Here we go. I'll just play a few seconds of the sound and just check to make sure that you can actually get it. Are yeah. you guys getting the sound on that? Uh, yes. Ripper, that's great. Oh, 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 Simon was so annoyed when he found out I could do this. Okay, <laughs> let's have a look at this and then we'll have a quick... I am Aurora uh, Jimenez so enjoy. and I am a visual development artist here at Sony Pictures Animation. I grew up in Madrid, Spain. My parents were very supportive. My mother, she wrote poetry and she used to draw. And my father, he's a comic collector, so he was giving me all his comics growing up. My parents had a bookshop and they sold all kinds of books and comics and art supplies. My sister and I, after school, we had to kill time until they closed the shop. So we just draw <laughs> and read and paint. All the awesome stories I read, I was visualizing every character, even designing extended stories for those characters, so I had a, a lot of fun. When we were on family holidays, we had to drive from Madrid to Cadiz in the south of Spain, and that is 400 miles. So my father came up with the stories while driving the 400 miles. It was something very interactive. He let us help him telling the story, so that was a lot of fun, actually. I think that the fact that we could contribute to the stories, that helped me a lot for later on coming up with my own characters and my own worlds. I wanted to be an artist, so I went to study fine arts. One of the subjects at the university was video art and computer animation, and I loved that class. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. I want to do that. I want to work in, in animation. After I got my degree in fine arts, I still wanted to do something related with animation. But the thing is, in Spain, there was no school for that. So I thought, OK, I can apply my knowledge in drawing and painting to film school. So I went to get my degree in art direction for film. I learned how to tell stories visually. In the long run, that's helped me a lot, because I could apply directly what I learned in the film school to animation. After graduating, I work in an animation company that was doing TV animated series. That was great because the art director mentored me and he was teaching me how animation works, what is the pipeline, what is the process, so I could shadow him and learn all of that. I met my husband, Carlos, on my last year at the film school. And he's an artist too. He was studying uh, art direction too. So since then we've been together. The thing of dating another artist is that the whole life becomes artistic. We are challenging each other all the time and learning from each other all the time. I wanted to work on more movies and in, at that time in Spain there wasn't very many animation companies so I decided to try abroad. So we moved to London and we ended up working in the same movie together, The Tale of Despero. One thing an artist has to be is open to explore, and traveling helps you to do that. When we finally moved to the US, my first job was in electronic arts, actually designing characters and environment for some of their games. 
and that was a great time and I got to learn something new. By that time, I had worked in so many different platforms like movies, commercials, TV series, and now video games. And I really love to learn how to apply my knowledge. I learned that Kelly Asbury was making a movie here at Sony Pictures Animation, so because I really like his work, I decided to apply to Sony and try to work with him. So I came for the interview and Michael Kurinska, production designer, saw my work and he loved it. So he offered me another job in a different movie, Hotel Transylvania 2. And he told me, you know, Gendy is the director. I was like, oh no, really? <laughs> I love his work. So it's what I did for a year, working with them in Hotel Transylvania. Hotel Transylvania 2 has lots of new environments. The first assignment I had is designing the monster camp. So I had to design from the big valley with the mountains, the forest, the lake, to the really, really small things the characters are using in the scene. Also, we have other environments, more human environments. and was very fun to, to design for humans versus monsters because we had to come up with different shape language and different ideas for them. After working at Hotel Transylvania 2 for one year and a half, I got the chance to work in the new Smurfs movie with Kelly Asbury. This movie is an uh, all animated movie and it's more close to the comic books from Peyo that I used to read when I was a kid, so it's quite exciting. I'm designing the, the worlds where the Smurfs are. It reminds me of my childhood when I used to play with the little figurines of the Smurfs. It's really great. I love the shape language, I love the style, it's cute and charming. What I like of working at Sony Pictures Animation is that I never got to work in the past with so many women artists. Here at Sony you have from the head of the studio, directors, production designers, visual development artists, even storyboard artists. It's really great to be surrounded by these talented women, learning from them and making friends with them. Sony Pictures Animation is a fairly small studio, so you get to know everybody. You get to work with artists who you admire, but you can call your friends because you have the opportunity to meet them every day, work with them and, and learn from them. So I'm pretty happy to be spending my whole day in that world. Okay, we might just leave that there. Okay. Righty ho. Now. Okay, uh, can you guys see the first slide now? Uh, yeah. Back to the top yeah. slide. Sweet. Okay. That's great. Oh, it's great to be able to play stuff and get you to have a look at it. Um, I did give you that link in the very first lecture. Did anyone see that before? Uh, yeah, I have. Have you? Anyone it's else? Quite, it's quite good. Yeah, it's, it's quite inspiring. And um, it's great to see, um, you know, her talking about the work environment at, at Sony Pictures being, being female friendly because it's just been a male dominated industry for a very long time. And my wife has found the same thing. So uh, yeah, we have a pretty creative uh, uh, life as well. It's really, it's really nice, nice, a nice fit. It's great. Um, but one of the things that she mentioned, and I was going to ask you guys about, is she talks about shape language when she was referring to the Smurfs. What do you think? Um, do you guys know what's meant by shape language? If you don't, that's cool. Because we're actually going to talk about this. Idea. In a later lecture, that's cool. Um, what it is, it's certain shapes have certain connotations, and we'll go through those. And one of the one of the things that um, we got given when we were working at, at Universal Pictures in London was a, a book, and it was all just photocopies that were stuck together because this was pre-digital, and a lot of it were, were notes from the old old Disney guys, the old Warner Brothers guys that had been photocopied for decades and decades. So they're pretty bad quality, but the content content of them is amazing. So it talks about using flowing lines. It talks about using, um, you know, forms like arches and, and, you know, things that connotate, you know, heat or anger or stress and other things that suggest calmness and this sort of thing. So that sort of shape language 
uh, that that's sort of what it what it means. But when she was referring to the Smurfs, I think she's sort of referring to like the proportions that they're sort of you know like two two and a half heads high, so they're kind of cute. They've got these sort of rounded forms, you know. The, apart from the uh, the evil character, I can't remember his name. Uh, oh, Anyway, um, even their shoes and, and their hands, they've got those little gloves on and stuff like that and, and their hats and stuff. So that's sort of what we mean by shape language and it really changes the way a character feels. So the, the look of the character um, does dictate what you, what you get from it. Um, but uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll keep looking at those sorts of things. I, I urge you to, to dig up as many uh, inspirational videos as you can find. Um, there's, there's a few more at the end there if we've got time to have a have a look at. Um, but it's yeah, it, it's nice to sort of you know start the the lecture off with something visual and then uh, be able to sort of refer to it. Anywho, we're going to get uh, get cracking. So can everyone see the second slide? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Good. Yep. Just checking. Just checking. Everything's working. So that's nice. Right. Okay. So we're going to talk more about composition because I think it's super super important. It's really what. Um, the main tool that you're going to use when you're designing for a production. And that's what it boils down to. So if we just concentrate on the idea of, of image creation in a very broad sense, and I'm trying to keep you guys um, at a frustratingly high level and not letting you get too specific, like with 3D, okay, you're going to get into the nuts and bolts and stuff. This is one subject where we can take an overview because the role of uh, pardon me, <coughs> fish for dinner, um, the role of production de designer is a very sort of high level uh, overarching role and w there's another interview which I'd like to show you at the end uh, with, a, with another production designer uh, who worked on a project called Littlefoot. I don't know if you guys have heard of that. Um, it's sort of like, you know, Bigfoot, Littlefoot, you can sort of see where that's going. But um, yeah, it's very high level stuff but the basics of it and the nuts and bolts of production design are really the same as the nuts and bolts of any art creation, whether you're talking about painting, you're talking about graphic design, you're talking about putting together a, a book, doing layouts for animation, doing, doing backgrounds. They all have slightly different purposes and so they'll be individualised, but the basics of composition you can never get too much of and that's what I really want to drive home in, in this series of lectures as well as giving you some uh, hands-on tips as well. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about what we're going to get through today. I want to talk to you briefly about um, submitting assessment one. So some of you have already gone down that path. Uh, just, just remember it's due in week four, which is this week, and I believe it's due by midnight on Sunday night or something crazy like that. Is it? I think that's normally how your assessments go. This is my first uh, assessment submission, so that's when I would, I would assume that on Monday morning when I, you know, um, when I go and check Canvas, you will have uploaded your briefs as a PDF and uh, as we talked about at the beginning of the lecture last week and also uh, just a link to your Pinterest board and you can email me that. That's, that's all you've got to do. And I'll be giving you feedback and I expect that feedback to be, to be incorporated into your second assessment and that'll form part of your, your marks as well. So we're going to talk more about composition. Um, we're going to keep talking about composition all the way through. Uh, we're going to look at the rule of thirds, not just as a tool to use, but also sometimes as a tool to avoid. Um, it's, uh, it's one of those things that you can use a little bit too much, but we'll get to that. Uh, we're going to talk about arabesques as well, which is a, a cool thing that I'd actually totally forgotten about and I just discovered again this week and I thought, oh, that's nice a nice thing to talk about in terms of composition and a way to stop you from getting stuck on having to use the rule of thirds all the time. Okay, we'll also talk about NOTAN and how it can be used to uh, really build good uh, foundations for your compositions. So we'll have a look at that. We're gonna have a look at Cloudy with the Chance of Meatballs 2 at the uh, production art. And as uh, again, if we've got time at the end, we'll have a look at some more, more interview type um, uh, films and have a, have a chat about those. So, first of all, um, this is for your uh, assessment. So, what I need for your Pinterest board is just the name of your Pinterest board or a link to it uh, in an email, and I'll just follow you and assess that board. So, you can have a separate board set up for that. Um, this, that, that, that's totally fine. That's all I want you to do for that. With regards to the written brief, though, uh, and I've got an example to show you, um, you have to submit to Canvas the PDF, a PDF document. 
And it's just a paragraph describing what you think your project is going to be. Now, this can change, and it might change based on some feedback that I give you, or you might just change your mind, in which case I expect that to be followed through and reflected into your research as well. Um, the most important thing is that you've got to get the file name convention right. Uh, and this is because if you don't do that in the industry, you can get into trouble, um, which I have done. So make sure we, we've decided, Simon's decided this is the, um, the format that we're going to use. It just makes, us e makes it easier for us teachers to um, know what we're looking at rather than getting a very random sort of file name. Okay, so just moving on to the written brief. Uh, this is an example I've just uh, pulled out of the air. Uh, for example, it might be project is a 3D animated trailer for an adventure game. It's set on an alien world which has a film noir feel, uh, feel about it. Okay, if you don't know what film noir is, I suggest you look it up. But it has to do with lighting and a lot of old films uh, in the film noir style. It, it, when it, it goes across lots of different genres. It's not a genre in itself, it's a, it's a style, it's a visual style, relying heavily on um, dark darks and uh, very dark sort of feel, lots of silhouettes and shadows and that kind of thing. Um, uh, and most of the action takes place at night. Okay, the action will take place in one location, will consist of no more than five shots and involve three main characters at most. Okay, that's, a, that's something that uh, remember I talked about the lift pitch where you've got to give someone an, uh, an outline of what your project is straight away. Um, this is good because it actually uh, it gives a lot of information about what your project's going to be. So don't, don't sort of adhere, adhere to it slavishly, but this is the sort of information that I want to get from your brief. So, for example, you've got to say what it is. So the first sentence should be, it's a 3D animated trailer for an adventure game. Great, that gives me lots of information. So we know what medium it's in, we know what the purpose is, it's for promoting you know, a bigger project, so the, the, the client or the person, uh, the director or whatever, or me, we understand, uh, we understand what it is. And we know that it's basic what the, uh, the genre is, and that's sort of more fleshed out in the, the second part of it. So the alien, alien world suggests that it's um, science fiction. So there's a, there's a bit, of, bit of crossover there. So set on an alien world, so we know it's set in space, basically. And I've just used examples from uh, one of my favourite um, science fictions that incorporates the film noir aesthetic really nicely. Really, Ridley Scott um, really handles it well in that, and also in Blade Runner as well. Um, fantastic use of, of lighting and mood. The whole point of using lighting in that sort of style in that way is to create mood. Okay, so we get an idea. It's set on an alien world. It's got film noir film. Feel so if you say that it's got that certain feel, um, that's great because then I know okay, I've got an idea that it's going to be fairly sort of dark and edgy, and yeah, so that's a lot of information uh, from that. Um, so the science fiction form, I immediately start thinking of Blade Runner and uh, Ridley Scott. Oh, actually, while I think of it, um, doo -doo. Uh, has anyone seen F uh, Fritz Lang's Metropolis? The poster here. No, Helen. Very old film. Very old film. Uh, very famous film, and it's it it's uses um, you know actual miniatures. I think it was made in the 30s or something like this. Miniature buildings and stuff, and there's like flying cars that are actually like little models on strings going through the shot. Um, it's 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 an absolute masterpiece for the time of when it was um, when it was created. And it's, uh, it's sort of, it drags on a bit, but it's visually absolutely stunning. But it's been referenced in so many films since then. And the most recent, recent reference I saw to this film was in Mad Max Fury Road. So there's a little exercise for you. I, I recommend you check out, check out, check out Metropolis um, and then have a look at Fury Road and see if you, can, see if you get what I mean. There's, there's a couple of scenes there where you just go, oh, my God, that's just straight out of Metropolis. Um, and it's good to make those connections when you're watching films. Another film was uh, Dark City and uh, that had a scene in it that was very much constructed like one of the main sets out of Metropolis. Fritz Lang, famous director, Metropolis is a very famous film that gets referred to a lot in the film Lexicon. So it's always good for you guys to know these things so you go, oh yeah, Metropolis. And people think you, you know, the bomb. Okay, so uh, I also want you to describe really the action, okay? 
um, when it happens, what time of day. This is an important thing to put into a, a brief. If you're just creating something that's small and you're really just designing for, um, uh, I've got in mind something that might be equivalent to your final project, which would be a minute of animation less. And you've really got to um, establish very early on what's in scope and what's out of scope. So your time of day, you don't want to be doing different times of day because that means creating all sorts of different scenes, it means lots of lighting complications and stuff like that. So you pick one time of day, okay, it's at night time, it's in space. So you've already got this kind of scary thing going on uh, in combination with the film noir, uh, film noir style. Um, so the scope is really super important. So the last sentence, uh, okay, it's in one location, no more than five shots. This is for, for a trailer, remember, uh, involve three main characters at most. Okay, so that immediately gives me an idea of whether it's achievable or not. Um, one of the most common mistakes for uh, students doing a, uh, a final project or any, any project that's animated is trying to do too much. Always, always trying to do too much. Very rarely does someone come up with something and you think, no, that needs fleshing out. It's always, you know, an epic that you're trying to contain down to something that is achievable and can be polished to a level that go, it can go up straight onto your showreel. And that's always what we've got an eye on here. Uh, everything you create for an assessment, you think, well, you know, apart from, you know, the written brief and your Pinterest page, would it be good enough to go into my folio? So the work you create for assessment three for this subject, I expect you to put a heck of a lot of uh, um, effort into with, with uh, one eye um, on your, your folio, okay? So, um, this sets out that it's one main background. It's in one location, so you know that ba that background or that set, if it's a 3D set, could be used to create the other shots within it. Um, and you know that there's three characters that have to be designed, built, rigged, and animated, and lit, and all that sort of stuff. So, something that can seem really uh, small in, in scope, when you break it down to all the tasks that need to be done, and this is something that you'll, you'll become very familiar with, um, you'll find that it's suddenly bigger than Ben-Hur, as they say, which is another movie you should watch. Okay, so we're going to talk more about the nuts and bolts of composition, and I, I keep uh, rabbiting on about this thing called the Rule of Thirds. Um, I'm assuming that you guys, have you heard of the Rule of Thirds? At all? Uh, yes, I have. Okay, is anyone not familiar with the Rule of Thirds? Okay, that's good. Silence is actually good in that case. Okay. Basically, in a nutshell, you know it is dividing your picture plane in thirds along the top and thirds along the side. And if you divide it up, where those uh, lines meet are just kind of good places to put um, the points of interest. That's really what it boils down to. However, if you only use the rule of thirds and you ignore all of those other wonderful compositional devices that we talked about last week, you'll end up with something really boring. Um, you'll end up with something like, uh, like this, and it's like, wow. You end up with a heck of a lot of negative space if you just do the rule of thirds. So you need to actually be aware of it, but not rely solely on it because it looks amateur. And it, it's like, you know, someone does, you know, a picture and they put it in the Rotary Art Show or something, I don't know, I'm trying to all put it on the fridge. You might use the rule of thirds, but unless you're looking at other stuff as well, like the contrast that we were talking about before, the levels of detail, the um, shape contrasts, the density contrast, and all this sort of stuff, pulling focus and perspective framing. Unless you do all of that and you, you know, you, you're not really gonna have a, a worthwhile picture at a professional level, which is what you guys are aiming at. You're professionals in training. This is uh, to give you a, a background in the, a production design. So you need to sort of think, high level, as I said before, and try to get a handle on all of the basics so that you're not relying on just one single technique. Now, the rule of thirds is, is really handy to know so that if you're having problems with a, with a composition and placing an element, you might go, well, I'm just gonna nudge it towards that node, like one of these, um, one of these intersection points just to make it, by virtue of it being in that point, a little bit more noticeable. But you've gotta keep in mind all of the other stuff as well. Um, that's probably the thing I've got to say about the rule of thirds. I never ever draw a grid, but I always look with an eye, whenever I'm painting or drawing, 
Um, if it's something that is a piece of artwork in and of itself, like a painting, a landscape or something like that, I'd rely on rule of thirds more. If it's something for a specific purpose and conforming to a brief, so you would call it more of an illustration or, or a piece of concept art, then you need to have more going on there than just the rule of thirds. That's that's my, my advice. So you can see this image here. There's a lot more going on than just the rule of thirds, but it does actually correspond in a rough way. Now, you, you never really go and, you know, slavishly, you know, just put four things on those, those dots and that's it. Um, but you can see here, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's some nice framing here with the dark element in the, in the corner. You've got this, uh, like a tangent, this, this element that's going more or less perpendicular to the sweep of that. Um, you've got the character, he's got a bit of a you know, line of action going on there. There's, uh, there's color, color contrast, there's contrast between shapes. There's a lot of stuff going on there besides just the rule of thirds. But however, the rule of thirds has helped, you know, the main mass of his chest is there. So the character is very readable. He's not right off leaning against the edge of the frame, which would look odd. And he's not bang smack in the middle, which would probably create a weird negative space behind him. Um, that's another thing. Uh, when you do position a, uh, an element on the page centrally, and there's a what you call um, a site direction, so we know that he's focusing this way, even the staff he's carrying is pointing that way to reinforce it. If he was moved over to the center, you'd sort of be expecting something to come in from behind and attack him. And that's one of the, that's when you start to learn film language you'll, uh, and storyboarding, you'll, you'll, you'll know that that's uh, one of the techniques that you can use. If you're leaving a space or the camera pulls back to re reveal the space behind someone who's occupied and doing something, you think, oh, someone's going to come up behind them and, and do something. So that's um, a bit of sort of telegraphing what's, what's going to happen. And that, that's film language, which is slightly different just to creating a single image. So you've got to keep all these things in mind. The most important thing is, what is the purpose of what I'm creating? If it's to uh, sell an idea to a direct director or a producer, you can just you know do whatever you want. If it's a storyboard, there's a different language involved, and uh, hopefully we'll get to talk about that a bit later. Okay, so don't forget about this stuff like leading the eye and using all the contrast. So all those all those tips and pointers I gave you last week, you can never learn those well enough. Really, really, really super important stuff. Okie dokie. So ah. I wanted to talk to you about something called the arabesque. So something, uh, this is a really good example of in um, uh, Van Gogh's, I think this is Starry Night. Um, this, you can see the placement of the tree in the foreground, more or less, it's more a third than a half, put it that way. Um, so it does kind of conform to the rule of thirds. Um, but you can see the main element for me is, is that sweep. Of, of, of light and, and the, the, the evening sky. And it, it's not straight. It doesn't just, you know, go across the screen. It's got this lovely curve and then it, it, it recurves back on itself. And then it's got this lovely little flourish at the end of it. And that's called an arabesque, basically. It's just like a curved uh, element in the composition. If you think about the line of action of a character, that can, if, if you've got a nice line of action, that sort of forms like an arabesque. It's a type of pattern. Um, but in film language, it's used to connote something that um, has a sort of a, a really lead your eye in a, in a really interesting way. And that's a really nice technique. Um, you can try this on your screens, is just take the left-hand image and just sort of put your thumb and put it back to yourself and just, just occlude, just get rid of that arabesque bit sort of in the center of the screen and just sort of think well, okay well it's yeah you're sort of reading the tree and you're reading the horizon more but once you take that out you've got this your eye just goes on this real sort of uh, almost a big dipper kind of thing um, and that's you know another example of, of Van Gogh's genius uh, and his madness I guess was to have these crazy um, things going on in, in the sky um, is that the golden ratio? Or? No, 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 no. I deliberately tried to stay away from the uh, the golden mean um, or the golden ratio or the Fibonacci sequence. Um, all that means is that you're, um, it's a ratio which relates to the height and width of a rectangle. Now, that rectangle, when you divide it, it's, it's a rectangle that can be divided into a square and a smaller rectangle that retains the same proportions as the original rectangle. That, that's all it is. When you look at it, 
basically, if you follow it to its logical conclusion and draw all the points and you end up with like a spiral, that ends up sort of roughly about where um, the bottom right hand third would be. Now, it's, it's a pleasing composition and it has a resonance. Uh, even credit cards, I think, just correspond to that, um, that, uh, that formula, if you like. Um, that's something we'll touch on a bit, bit later. But that was sort of going down a bit of a rabbit hole for me and I just wanted to um, maybe leave that for a later time because students can, I've found in the past, can get really hung up on it. I'm like, why are we learning this? And, and you know, you can give them exercises of actually creating one and you can do that if, if you like. But the main thing is to remember your compos compositional basics. Um, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting thing in and of itself. And that's more of an advanced compositional technique, which I would like to talk to you possibly next week in conjunction with um, some other ones that don't rely on the rule of thirds. So basically, I wanted to talk just about the rule of thirds this week and then basically sort of break that apart a little bit when we, when we um, talk about it down the track. So, yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we will mention it, but I just don't want you to get too hung up on that at the moment. Okay. The main thing is... Put on? I don't get hung up on it. It just no, no, no. in my mind no. when I'm doing stuff. I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, okay, so the main thing is to get the compositional basics down and master your craft. So the things that we talked about last week, that's what you've got to look at. This is an example of using an arabesque um, in compositions, and it's just like rough sketches. When you first start a sketch, and your, your hand is roving over the page. And even when we're looking at people doing uh, compositional roughs and stuff like that, they'll be throwing around shapes and they'll often be rounded rather than just straight lines. No one starts a, a composition just by doing straight lines, unless that's a specific thing you want to do. If you're an artist like Vernon R. Key, sometimes he's created portraits just by using straight pencil lines. And they, they are brilliant. He's an Australian indigenous artist. Uh, Vernon R. Key, if you're interested in looking at, at that. But we're talking about composition for production design in, uh, specifically. So that's uh, one way of using arabesques to create that kind of effect. And what it does, it suggests uh, an element of dynamism and movement. And you can then juxtapose that with some sharp edges, um, some more rectangular shapes and that kind of thing if you want to contrast uh, want to create some, uh, some contrast. Okay, here's an example just using um, light drawing. So in a way, that's why um, figure drawing uh, and particularly gesture drawing is so appealing uh, and why it's so appealing to me is because you can get those incredible curves in, in, uh, in short poses. So uh, just be, just be aware, that's a term that people don't use very very often, the arabesque, but um, it's good to be aware that it's there. Okay, another concept I want to talk to you about, which you may not have heard about, I think we mentioned it in the first lecture, is the one of Notan, which basically just means breaking the image down into black and white so that you can clearly see the relationship between shapes and the overall pattern of the image to see whether it's working. Okay, well, um, it brings into play a lot of things like silhouette and contrast, obviously very high contrast. Any image that you're working with, you can take into Photoshop or any other um, visual program and basically just pump up, pump up the contrast, uh, reduce the color, and you can basically create this from any, any image to see whether it's working or not. Um, it's just another tool in your toolkit for drawing. And it's important to um, just remember you've got these things to rely on if you're having trouble. And also, if you want to make sure that your, build, your uh, drawings have a solid foundation, um, the relationship between the lights and the darks, I think, is probably the most, um, probably the most important one. Interesting. It's, it's like there's a little silhouette of Alfred Hitchcock here. <laughs> um, the guy's uh, right arm. Anyway, that's what I see. Here's an example of some small sketches done in just in black and white in the no tan style. Uh, like we mentioned when we were looking at the skillful huntsman in week one, there's uh, something used here called the lost line technique. So you can see in some of these images here, it's broken up with a white line. And so that, for example, here, the forms are broken up, uh, suggesting that there's some form of detail or something going on there. Here it's used really nicely to create perspective. Um, but basically, the object is continuous, 
but the broken line technique just adds that little bit of interest without actually adding detail. It's actually by taking something away, which is which is kind of nice. Um, this reminds me of the storyboards. Has it, uh, anyone seen the the TV series Batman animated, the animated series? It's a the two D one, and um, one of the lead designers on that was a guy called Bruce Tim, one of the, my favourite all time um, animation artists and designers. And he uh, he did some storyboards that were very much like this. They were so they were so cleverly done. I'll make, make a note to show you those next week. Um, and clever use of silhouette and shape and direction, so much so that there's almost no detail in them at all, but they just tell the story beautifully. Uh, and that's the power of mastering black and white, no tan. Um, I think some people pronounce it no tan. I think the Americans do, but um, basically it just comes down to uh, reducing the image just to black and white. So it's not that helpful for the final image, but it's just something good to uh, maybe sort out a problem if something's not working, like reducing something to a silhouette, that kind of technique. Okie dokie. Now this is um, a little, uh, little snippet, a little film uh, by a guy called Mitch Albala, who's a uh, landscape painter. And I've followed his work for a few years now and I really, really like the way he explains stuff. So if you want to know more about No Tan, no tan um, the absence of sunlight, um, you can actually watch this and, and just get a different different take on it. It's more coming from a uh, fine art point of view, but the, uh, the foundations are totally applicable to what you guys are going to do. So you can see up the top there, A, B and C, he's playing around with different um, No Tan, uh, configurations to get the best composition and he's finally ended up with something I think the, the third one there where you've got something that's sort of leading the eye a bit leading it into the picture and also out because and the eye travels around the um, three objects that are, that are lit um, so check please check that out in your own time uh, I want to go a little bit more deeply into uh, the production design of specific projects and I think that's really something worth doing um, is looking at examples, uh, looking at them and uh, absorbing as much as you can from them. So uh, I love the style of, of Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Um, it's, uh, I didn't think I was going to like it when I first saw it, when I first saw the first film. I thought, oh, you know, these characters just aren't finished, you know. But one of the signs of good design is that when you see these guys moving, which is uh, the whole purpose of animation, when you see these designs moving, they absolutely work. And they work so well because they're so simple, they're so clean. The, the design purposely, I think, leaves room for the imagination because the, the way they move is like another element of their design, if you know what I mean. It's sort of uh, when, you, when you watch the animation, the animation is, is superb in this series of movies. I really love it. It's very cartoony, um, it's very expressive. It really, really hones in on the character of the character. So um, it, it shows a lot of personality um, by the way the character moves. And this, this goes back to the old Disney sort of flower sack thing where people used to get it, they used to have to draw a flower sack and get it to express emotions by the way it was moving or the way it was posed. And that's, um, that's, that's a, um, a, a sort of a stripped down example of that. But they, these characters, I think, um, uh, when they're moving, they seem a lot more complete than when you just see an image of them. And that's a sign of really good, really good animation and also really good design. So we'll have a look at, um, I've got a little film to show you on that, but I just want to show you some images first from the, um, the making of book. Um, absolutely, really, really suggest um, strongly that you collect some hard, hard copy books, not just digital versions, of beautiful artwork from your favourite film. So if you can, when you can afford it, um, you, can actually, you can actually get a lot of these from uh, a big library. If you're near a big library, sometimes they have these kind of books. Um, collect as many as you can. Um, I've got most of the Miyazaki films uh, making of books um, and it's just a really great way to you can just pour over these things for hours and hours and just read quotes from really uh, fantastic designers and artists and I just love the mood in these images here and I really love these little botanical 
um, experiments up here in the top right hand corner where where the artist is just actually just honing in on one little, little element and going, okay, well, here's some different leaf types. You've got like a variegated pattern. You've got gradients. You've got little, little, uh, little chinks, little bite marks out of them. Um, it, it's fabulous. And you see this, this image here, it just hangs together so well just in terms of colour styling. And here, down the bottom, I mean, you've got, you've got the characters there. The staging is all set. Um, this might be a good time to actually talk about when, when you're creating a, a background for animation, whether it's 2D or 3D, the real rule used to be that when you look at a background on its own, it should look as though something's missing. It shouldn't look like a really finished, complete composition. Now, why would that be? Can someone tell me that? You don't want to take the glory away from the main character. Well, that's right. You've got to leave space. You've got to leave space for the characters. It's it, yeah. you're right. It's as simple as that. So if you if you've got an animation background, and this used to happen at Hanna Barbera when I used to go and you know I used to hang out in the background department because they used to use airbrushes, like real airbrushes, and and uh, animation cell paint, you know, watered down to be almost like a, a watercolor. Um, it was fascinating. And um, the guy there, Richard Zaladek, big was really famous background artist, worked on some feature films. And, and he was saying that if, if uh, the background is, is too complete, if it looks too good, it won't work in the shot. So it's got to actually look like something's missing, um, which is kind of, yeah, it's kind of cool. Um, so we'll have a look at some more. So here's some more really lovely images here. I just love the, um, I love the stripped back style of the final film, but I also love it when you're seeing uh, the pre-production art when they actually do very, very basic colour styling. Now, the, the look of the final film is quite flat. So that's, uh, that's also reflected in, in these, these studies as well. I love this top right-hand picture there with the dad coming through. Um, okay. So again, some more, more images from the making of. Uh, you can sort of see where, you know, it's very, very obvious where the inspiration has come from food um but you know like these sort of tree forms here look like sort of asparagus spears that are sort of gone a bit gonna be a haywire there's levels uh, there's um density of, of detail up here to create the um sort of filling in the space without dominating it there's lots of the design principles that we looked at you, your eye sort of picks up on this area by contrast the dark color and the light color on the coconut and it sort of flows down with the water and your eye travels along it and then you pick up other stuff and you sort of come back and you concentrate sort of on this, this sort of area. Um, there's a nice bit of framing here. There's all sorts of great stuff in these books. And it's so inspiring. It's really, really important that you surround yourself with as much inspiring material as you can find. That's, um, that's the journey that you're on is to have stuff around you that you love. And if you, if you really like a film, try to get hold of the making of book. Um, that's uh, very, very important. Okay, we're well, going to quickly watch this. So I didn't mean to repeat that picture there. Uh, this is uh, very short, only five minutes. I want to play this, and it's with the um, uh, Justin Thompson, a guy who was a production designer on, on, on Meatballs, and uh, we'll have a quick look at that. And let's just see if I can get there. Is everyone getting the sound? Uh, anybody... Yes. Yeah, I'm getting the sound. No worries. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I just keep checking because I just don't want to play something and go, oh, did you hear that? And you're like, no. Um, and that's, that's the thing that doesn't work sometimes. Okay. One of the biggest challenges for... Sorry, I just got to point out, the way that guy runs... I mean, if you want to make someone look excited, why not have their arms windmilling as they run? I'm sorry, I just couldn't help playing that out. Our production designer is creating a unique style for every one of our films. When we catch up to Flint Lockwood in Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 2, he and his father have moved into a one-bedroom apartment in the mythical town of San Fran Jose, California. San Fran Jose is an idyllic mix of San Francisco and San Jose, a friendly coastal town that is quite literally built around the giant technology firm LiveCorp. In the early design stages, we chose to make San Fran Jose appear more grounded in the real world than the rest of the film, 
so that it could act as a launching pad for all the fantasy elements that show up later in the story. We designed every one of our textures by hand, using traditional mediums like gouache, acrylic paint, and watercolors. The look of Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 2 is pushed much further than the first film because the story has a much bigger fantasy element that demanded more fun, creative choices. When our characters return to Swallow Falls for the first time, at first it seems intimidating. It took us a while to figure out the right balance because we didn't want the situations to be too scary. But once we added the bioluminescence and color to our early development work, suddenly everything sprang to life and the scenes went from feeling spooky to feeling mysterious and fun. From the second you step on the island, I wanted the audience to know they were in a storybook, that they were in a fantasy. Oh, look what's happened to our town. The directors and I were intrigued by this idea that on a subliminal level that when the island got destroyed, Flint's lab spilled out over the island and all this color exploded on the island that wasn't there before. The directors challenged me to come up with a new shape language, so we focused in on a very organic arabesque design. How is that even possible? Oh, I didn't know those words were going were to come up. So yes, shape language and arabesque. Well, Possible. I have no idea. Best we don't think about it. The world should know about this. To achieve the fantastic, whimsical feel that matched the tone of the story, we created a living painting, so to speak, that allowed the audience to get lost in the story. Textures were actually created in 2D. We used India ink, watercolor, gouache, and markers to create all kinds of swatches, which we then scanned into the computer and used as custom textures and brushes, then applied to the three-dimensional geometry. Syrup is my favorite. It was a really fun challenge to design this amazing moment where Flint Lockwood and his friends experienced the beauty and diversity of this new ecosystem for the first time. As the wonder of this new world opens up for them, the film explodes in a rainbow of color. From that point on in the film, we stay in that fun, colorful palette. It's enough to make a grown man cry. Oh, it's so beautiful. Early on in development, we did hundreds of designs of food creatures which we narrowed down to about 120 that appear in the film. The ones that play the biggest part are the berries, the pickles, the cheese spider, and the tocodiles. And for those creatures, we spent a lot of extra time to hero out their designs and give them a huge range of expressions. In the early stages, when we were designing them, there were often lengthy discussions about the logic of these fun creatures. However, we quickly realized that Logic only gets you so far in a cartoon as broad as Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 2. At some point, you have to stop asking how they would exist and go along for the ride. The directors were adamant that they shouldn't be scary, and we decided to make them cute and lovable instead, almost like stuffed animals. We wanted the audience to find the food creatures lovable because we were hoping that they would want to protect them at all times. Overall, these fun food creatures, along with the stylized world of Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 2, will be a place where kids and adults can lose themselves and feel like they are exploring the island with Flint while he's on his journey. Cool. Um, I particularly like the way they talked about using natural mediums, um, like gouache, watercolor, um, ink and uh, probably you know stuff like colored pencil and that as well bring that into the 3d world as, as texture um, some of you have been asking questions about you know um, using natural medium these things work hand in hand and I really encourage you to investigate all forms of, of art um, uh, because they can all be combined in different ways and the sky's the limit I don't think we've seen 
every single combination that you can you can imagine. There's still stuff to be discovered out there. It's a really exciting time to be getting into animation, I think. Anywho, oh, oh, does, uh, anyone a fan of uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine? Yeah. Yeah. Did you know that uh, Andy Sandberg and Terry Crews would do the two of the voices in that movie? I thought I heard um, Terry. I haven't actually seen the movie for myself, but yeah. yeah. He, he's, he's the copper and Annie Sandberg was the guy in the, the chicken suit. Um, I didn't realise that um, until, until recently. I thought, of course, that's, of course that's Terry Crews. Who else could it be? Um, it's fantastic. Um, probably due to watch this film again, I think. Um, okay, so I'm just going to get rid of that and come back to, to where we were. The problem with our PowerPoint is once you quit out of it, you then have to find your points again. No. Here we go. Uh, okay, so moving along with the lecture. Um, again, just reinforcing the idea of collecting art old books. Um, really uh, such a valuable resource. And uh, I, hope, I hope you guys are sort of into that anyway. Um, you get to see a lot of stuff that doesn't appear in the film. And to me, sometimes that's the most interesting stuff is what is left out. Um, one of the best things I saw was on the Incredibles DVD. There was an interview with, um, oh, his name's just escaped me. The director also worked on The Simpsons, Brad Bird, um, talking about uh, going through the animatic of the scene where um, Mr. Incredible first uh, uh, sort of reveals his powers, if you like, to the neighbours um, when he accidentally chops. He goes, he's chopping something up and... It's like he's chopped his fingers off, but of course the knife has basically bent around his fingers. So then uh, Elastigirl is like covering up, going, oh, oh, oh my God, oh my God. But it was just a bit clunky. It was a beautiful scene, but it just, you know, something had to go and they just had to choose that particular scene. So it's really good to watch uh, versions of the film where you've got a bit of a, a, a documentary element or, or even a commentary from the, the director. Um, and you can get really good insights into how these these projects are put together. Um, it's 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 fantastic. It's almost like being in the studio when you're when you're getting inside the brain of the people who made this stuff. It's it's absolute gold. Um, cool. Now we've got some resources for you. Uh, I'll just go through some of these images. I just pulled ones out from uh, Jurassic Park. Um, the uh, d designer. Um, Rick Carter, um, who I think, he, I think he only worked on the first film, but I've got images from the other films as well. Also here, um, there's the one from uh, Aurora in this, which I showed you before. Um, this is a, a general sketching uh, uh, kind of a tutorial thing. It's great because this this guy, I can't pronounce his name, Walid Ghali, he, um, he talks about the value of just getting a, a pencil, sharpening it up and just getting into it. Um, and that's great. That's, that's quite inspiring as well. So with drawing, you know, five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, I know you guys were busy, but just, just try to do something every day if you can. Um, and it, it, all, it all adds up. And it's just a really great way of keeping, keeping your, your eye in and your hand in. So you've got the hand-eye coordination. Um, if you're working on a tablet, it doesn't matter. You're still doing it. You're still using the same muscles in your head, really, um, no matter what um, materials or um, methods you're using. Um, there's another one there uh, from the same guy that did the um, uh, the thumbnailing last week. We had a look at the, the chap who did the thumbnailing. He brought it into Photoshop. They flipped it, turned it upside down, and just started working into it, into it again, which I thought was a really great way of... Uh, breaking the uh, the thought process down where you kind of get stuck on one idea. This is a really good process for freeing up your mind to look at things in a completely different way. And art and concept art development, uh, visual development, it's all about looking at things in a different way. I mean, take those animals, the food animals from, uh, from meatballs. I mean, that's that, how much fun would that have been, you know, going, okay, well, guys, you know, go out and sort of think of animals that we can make out of food. I mean. <laughs> Uh, you, you could do that forever. That's great. That's really good. Um, so I, got, I was just going to pick one of these to show you just for the final bit of the, um, the lecture. But just before we do, just have a look more of some of the concept work from the Jurassic Park world. Um, and here's some storyboards, storyboard images from the, uh, from the first one. 
So storyboarding I see as part of the development process as well, although it's been treated as, as a different uh, thing in terms of um, the way you're learning stuff. And it's good to look at storyboarding once you've done script writing because in terms of production, that's, that's the way things flow. So um, that's, that's something to... To look at, but it's also it's part of it, it is part of the design process. Some of the some shots, and I've worked on TV series where there could be a problem, and you know rather than trying to fix it in animation, sometimes you've got to go back to the storyboard and just completely restage it, um, and that saves a lot of time and effort, and which means money. Okay, and here's a here's a bit of three D concept work for the um, uh, the Magna Drive gyro ball. Okay. Yes. Okay. Before we get ask for questions, let's go play you. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. We might just go to the Jurassic Park one. That's only seven minutes long. I really, really want you to check out the the bottom two. Okay. So the sketching one and the idea of using a limited grayscale palette to create tonal compositions at a small size. Uh, just using, you know, um, rather than using the white of the paper, covering it in a mid-tone, going in with a light tone, and then having a, a darker tone as well. Um, there's some really good stuff in there. It's just a little bit too long to show you this evening. So I'll have a quick look at uh, Rick Carter um, talking about Jurassic Park. Come on, you can do it. Now, the link has got a red thing on it. I don't know why that's happening. Oh, no. that seems to be, yeah, I don't know why it's doing that. Well, maybe we won't do that. So you're going to have to look at these on your own. <laughs> I don't know why that those links are not working unless it's actually. Uh, 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 Can you right click on it and see what happens? Yeah, um, right clicking, no. That there's something okay. weird. Look, I do have the actual, like you put the little hand coming up as if it's active. Oh, wait a minute. I was pressing control at the same time. Uh, ah, here we go. Sorry about that. Here we go. We'll have a quick look at this and have a quick discussion after it. Creativity to me is being inspired and then intuitively understanding what to do with it. Oh, Sarah, have you ever drawn with a paint tube? If you haven't, you should. It, it is very good fun. So it's realized as something that other people can actually regard. The drive to create, it comes from a very deep place. And I think that that's essentially something I've, for whatever reason, been put here to do. Production designer is the person who's uh, responsible for designing the world the movie takes place in. But it's kind of a magic trick because it really is involved with creating the suspension of disbelief. If you're watching with the idea that you're watching what we've done, then you're not in the movie. You could be admiring the movie, but if you're not in the movie. You're not empathizing with the characters. They're not meeting you halfway in that space that's not even on the screen. This is from uh, my work on Castaway. That's a rock we put in. It's funny just to think about all the things that go into making a movie of one guy alone with a volleyball on an island, but how much actually it's just outside the frame. My background is in fine arts and painting, mostly figurative and actually mostly portraits. But I also was a traveler at a young age, all the way back when I was 17 and 20 and 22, literally going around the world for a year at a time. That's what I've used as the basis as a production designer to create worlds and places so that I can actually have been inspired or go on location and find a place that inspires me in relationship to a movie and then either take people there literally or create that or some aspect of that. Your process always evolves. For me, it's actually very important not to know what I'm doing to actually be exploring at all times. Every movie is a different movie, it's a new exploration. I always go into it looking for that blank canvas to begin with, not preconceptions, and find that level that I can collaborate on. In Avatar, there was a lot of time spent looking out at the ocean, partly because 
It was such a vast world that we were creating that had so much scope that I often felt being next to the ocean and looking out, it was a way of getting a sense of how big of a world I was trying to help create. My eyesight is a very basic relationship to my, my creative process. I have a far-sighted eye and a near-sighted eye. So I found that that split has led to a kind of sense that it's between the two eyes that I find myself. That's why I say it's, it's mind the gap. Right there is where I go and I realize that there's two things that are contradictory to go to the middle and that's where the creativity is going to be found. Creating something that everybody can see, that's where it starts to become a pragmatic art. And that means having illustrations, locations, set designs, where you actually can say, this is what we want to feel like, this is what we want it to look like. So if I was being asked to do a house or a movie that took place in the Northwest, one of the things I could do now that I didn't use to be able to do would be just to go on Google and type in Northwest house and then start to see what's available. And so I'll just start to make a file, but I free associate. So let's say I'm thinking about that and it's a story of adolescence or something like that. And I decided that, you know, I, I'm gonna put in The Graduate because my mind goes to The Graduate. And I'm looking for anything that kind of catches my eye that I might be able to apply. That place then that I'm referencing also has an intimate side, which of course is in my own house. And I'm just thinking about the movie or what inspires me. Or I'll go out to my studio garage and I'll think about things there or start to paint just people. It's not even uh, backgrounds. It's not, it's not exactly production design at all. The idea is that it gets me in touch with my own artistic expression. And I think by painting and going from essentially a blank canvas, I just start swirling paint, don't know what it's going to be, take it all the way to the point where it's just a simple face. I'm doing the entire artistic process. So then when I engage a director or any of the artists that I'm working with, I know instinctively and I'm in sync with them about what it is to create an artistic piece. The thing that I do that's probably not like most people, I don't create a book of here's the mood for a movie. I look at it as a continuum of a career that is sort of as a artist traveler, the way the Orientalists were. And I'm going out into the world or into my mind or collaborating and I'm bringing to other people what it is that I've discovered. So what I do often after that, when I've worked on a movie, is I'll make a book about that movie. What I like about doing these, and they're all over the place, is that they're a record for me to go back to, that I can see where I've come from, and perhaps even instincts about where I might be heading in, in this journey that involves cinema and, and uh, painting. The, the one that I'm just turning to here just has to do with Lost World. Coming up with a sense or a feeling of how that Lost World wanted to come across with the dinosaurs, and so I would do all these collages. I would have either little figurines or I would actually just cut out a dinosaur 2D image and put it into those compositions to see how they looked. And came up with sort of the idea that we could actually go to a redwood forest and have dinosaurs, even though it's supposed to be off the coast of uh, Costa Rica, because um, I had this sense that we could really use the trees there. And that came from creating these collages. What makes someone creative is I think a combination of having an innate, I suppose, curiosity on one hand so that you keep churning to find out more. You're aware of what you don't know, but you don't become intimidated by the fact that you don't know it. It actually is what leads you forward. And it's what actually is to be fulfilled in your life or your art. Production design specifically is a place where it encompasses the kinds of things that I'm interested in and can do well enough. And so I do it because I get a good response and also I like doing it. And it essentially gets me high. I actually feel an elevated sort of sense of, of purpose and accomplishment when I get to work on a movie. Great, some really nice words about uh, inspiration and the creative process. Um, yeah, I think <clears throat> he'd be a really great guy to sit down and have a chat with, I think. Um, just his breadth of knowledge and the way he connects the dots between the fine art stuff and the, the movie um, production design stuff and, and the way he talks about 
being able to talk to other creatives um, and you know it's all about the process so um, yeah that's a that's a quite a nice nice little segue there okay now any questions would anyone like to ask anything that might be worth recording um, with regards to that what we've talked about this evening I should animate a tumbleweed going across the screen. <laughs> I was going to say not for me. No, yeah, but it's still looking. Yeah, no, I can't think of anything. Can't think of anything? It's funny, the first week, you know, I wanted to ask questions in the second week, uh, and then it's like it's getting gradually, as, as more assessments come in, you're sort of like <laughs> running out of steam. Uh, I, I, I'm with you. I know what that feeling's like. Um, yes. Well... Hopefully that sort of gave you something. Um, do check out those extra links that I gave you. Um, they're, they're super, super good. Um, we could even keep watching one if you wanted to hang on. Um, if no one's going to ask questions, that sort of doesn't really give me anything to, to talk about for the discussion part. Would you like to have a look at the one about doing the value comps now that I've worked out how to um, click on the link properly? Would you, you guys be up for that? I'm up for it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. If you if you, if you need to to um, disappear, that's okay. What I will do though is I'll stop the recording because otherwise it'll be a massive file, and Simon will yell at me. Um, so I'll just stop recording now.